I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. This is Book of Mormon Central's Come Follow Me Insights today, 3rd Nephi 27 through 4th Nephi. So let's begin with a little scenario. Let's pretend like you're sitting in a fast and testimony meeting and somebody comes up to the, the pulpit to bear their testimony and at the end of their testimony they say, I know that the church is true, and then they finish and sit down. And then the next person comes up to the very same pulpit and they bear their testimony. At the very end they say, brothers and sisters, I know that the gospel is true, and then they sit down. So here's the question. Is there a functional or a major difference between those two testimonies? If somebody says, I know the church is true or I know the gospel is true, often the way we, as common, common speech goes in the church, we sometimes interchange those two words and, and think that we're saying the same thing. When you open up uh, the scriptures to 3rd Nephi 27, you're going to see this incredible chapter where the first half of the chapter is all about the church of Jesus Christ, and the second half of the chapter is all about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he very, very clearly shows their, their uniquely um, complementary differences, how they work together for him to fulfill all of his promises and to keep all the covenants which have been made with, uh, with us on the earth. So you'll notice when it begins, the problem, the, the disciples of Jesus in the New World, they have this question, they have this problem, what do we name the church? Jesus established this church among us, but we, we don't have a name for it, so they're praying when uh, all of a sudden the Lord appears, he came and stood in verse 2 in the midst of them, and he says, what will ye that I shall give unto you? By the way, just as a side note here, isn't it interesting how often God asks questions of people, the answer to which God already knows, it, but there's something beautiful about him getting people to act, use their agency, and to ask before he just comes and gives them things that he already knows better than they do what they need. So here it is again. He's asking them this question. And their answer is, well, we want to know the name whereby we shall call thy church, because there are disputations among the people concerning the matter. So there have actually been arguments and maybe contentious uh, debates back and forth. So notice what he says in verse 5. Uh, Have they not read the scriptures which say that ye must take upon you the name of Christ, which is my name? for by this name shall ye be called at the last day." So, when establishing his church, he's making a really big deal about the name being his own, that you've got to take upon you the name of Christ, because name in Scripture, especially in, in antiquity, is associated directly with power. This is the name or the power by which we do what we need to do moving forward. Now, we need to be careful here because he doesn't end at this point. It's not just, oh, well, anybody can set up any church they want and just as long as you call it the Church of Jesus Christ, then you're totally fine because he gives another clarification. Look in verse 8. What are the requirements for it to really truly be his, for him to own it? Look at verse 8. How be it my church, save it be called in my name? For if a church be called in Moses' name, then it be Moses' church, or if it be called in the name of a man, then it be the church of a man, but if it be called in my name, then it is my church, if it so be that they are built upon my gospel." So we're going to talk about that uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So he's saying it has to be uh, called by my name and built on my gospel. So there's this foundation of the gospel. Uh, look at this. We, we have a church today that has kind of a long name. 
when, when I was younger and, and when I was a missionary down in Brazil, I, I used to think it a bit odd that we would go around and tell people the name of our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and everybody else's church, it seemed, was only, you know, a one-word name or title, um, very simple, and ours took a whole breath to be able to say it. That used to be a, a, a bit of an annoyance to the natural man in me until the day that I started to connect some dots. Next to verse 8, you may want to write a cross-reference in your scriptures if you, if you like uh, annotating your scriptures. Write DNC 115 verse 4 in the margin, because this is where Jesus Christ officially named our church in the latter days, and you'll notice President Russell M. Nelson has made a, a beautiful um, impact on the way that we refer to the church, that we no longer just call it by its nicknames of the LDS church or the Mormon church or the Mormons, because it kind of flies in the face of everything Jesus is teaching his disciples here. So if somebody ever asks you, are, are you Mormon? Your simple answer should be, no, I'm Tyler. Mormon was a guy who lived like over 2,000, well, almost 2,000 years ago, and he's long dead. We're not Mormon. We are distinct individuals as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and there's power in, in knowing that it's Jesus Christ who is the head of the church, not Mormon. Just a little side note. If you go to section 115, this is the verse that President Nelson has quoted uh, referring to this correction in how we refer to the church. It's here where the Lord says, and thus shall my church be called and then he gives it its name. Now, let me just ask a really simple question. You ready? Whose church is it? Now, if I were a betting man, I would bet a lot of money that the vast majority of you said in your mind, well, Tyler, that's a dumb question. Everybody knows it's, it's the Savior's church. And you would be right, but only partially so. Why? Look at the name. Let's dissect this for a second. You've got the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, you ready for this? Let's look at it word for word. First word. Notice he didn't just call it a church. He called it the church. Using the direct article, the, it signifies a, a singularity of to, to one degree or another, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, so hold that thought. But this is the church, and then you'll notice of Jesus Christ. In English, what form, what, what grammatical function does the word of perform in a sentence like this. One way to look at this would be it's showing ownership or possession. This is the church of Jesus Christ. It belongs to Jesus Christ. So when I asked you whose church is this, most people just instant, instantaneously think, well, it's Jesus Christ's church, and you're right. The funny thing is, is look at the name. How many ofs are there in the name of the church? This is the one that a lot of people miss. The reality is, it is the church of Jesus Christ, but it's also the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He who is perfect opens up the ownership and makes it joint ownership. It's our church. It's not just his church. We're not outsiders coming in as, as non-residents in this church. It's joint ownership. Now, brothers and sisters, this, this is one of the most beautiful principles for me when I look at the organization, the, the 
um, the global religion called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because we live in a world, we live in a culture where uh, organized religion and organizations in general are being um, looked at with very, very uh, negative eyes, lots of scrutiny, finding all the fault, all the wrong, pointing out everything that's bad about them. And the interesting thing to me is, is this particular world organization, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is not is not your typical worldwide organization. There's some major differences going on here with, with this particular church. Let me show you what I mean. What you have is Jesus Christ with all of his perfection, with all of his power, with all of his capacity, with everything that you could ever want or need, he has it in abundance, in infinite proportions, and he who could do everything without any flaw, what does he do? He opens the door and invites in a whole bunch of people, we call them saints, not because they're perfect, not because they're holy, but because of what they're striving to become, but because of a covenant that they've made with him and they've combined with him. So watch what happens. You open the doors, in this organization to a whole bunch of people who struggle with some imperfections. We've got I, – I should make this plural – we've got problems. Now let's just be really honest. Don't you think that the Lord Jesus Christ, as a glorified, perfected God, resurrected in heaven, couldn't he do a far better job of being the bishop of our wards or the stake president? or for that matter the prophet, or the missionary, or the ministering brother, couldn't he, couldn't he give every lesson infinitely better than we give them? Couldn't he deliver the perfect sacrament talks every Sunday and people would just keep coming and the numbers would grow and the spirit would be enveloping? He could do everything perfectly, but what does he do? He turns it over to us because in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it's not about a perfect, flawless performance. It's about growth. It's about covenant progression along the path that leads to becoming like him. And you can't take little children and expect that if you don't let them stumble and fall and learn and grow and develop from their own experience and making mistakes, lots of trial and error, they'll never grow up to become what they were intended to become. So God gives us this organization, this safe space where we can be imperfect in certain ways. We, we can get things wrong even when in counsel with others and we're doing the best we can and we get it wrong. Somehow, it's okay because we're learning from those and the church is this living, breathing, growing uh, entity of people and we have Jesus Christ at the head who makes it okay for us to do our best and to struggle. The church then becomes this symbolic lens through which you can look in the mirror for yourself. God created the church, but just because he created the church and he gave it its agency and its ability to learn and develop, develop and figure out how to, how to run its practices and, and procedures doesn't mean that God created you and then expected you instantaneously to be perfect just because he created you. He puts you in situations where you have to adapt, you have to learn, you have to develop over time. And that's what's happening with the Church of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, in our day and age, it's beautiful to see how quickly things are coming that are ad helping us adapt collectively because he is at the head of this work. This is not the church of our prophet. It's not the church of Joseph Smith. It's not the church of your bishop or your stake president. It's the church of Jesus Christ of then all of the collective group Latter-day Saints, 
with a prophet, with, with prophets, seers, and revelators at the head, getting that direction for all of us, and then we do our best to move forward in spite of our imperfections. So it's the easiest thing in the world to look at an organization or to look at a group of people and, and find fault, point out the flaws, say, well, that's really bad, versus saying, what is the overall goal? What are these people trying to do? What is their mission as, a, as an organization? So instead of pointing out the flaws, recognize, yeah, there are going to be some, some imperfections along the way, but the overall trajectory is they're under the direction of Jesus Christ moving forward. And I love what uh, Joseph Smith said about this, no unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. Why? Because he's at the head, and he can change things. In, in an instant, he can change certain things to accelerate the work or turn it in a different direction, and that's wonderful. You'll notice that because of the, the skepticism of our, of our age, of our culture and our society, it's so easy to point fingers of, of finding fault and negativity that uh, because of that, it's really easy for people to fall into this pattern of simply uh, putting the burden of proof and the burden of, of uh, moving forward on everybody else but themselves. So it's this true-false test. So you'll, you'll see this all the time, people saying, oh, was Joseph Smith a true or a false prophet? Is the church true or is it false? Is the Book of Mormon true or false? Is President Nielsen a true or a false prophet? Is my bishop true or false? Is my spouse true or false? Is – you get the idea. On and on and on and on it goes with these true-false tests that we put every, everything to. I'm just going to say it. The best true-false test you can run is in the mirror because, quite frankly, it doesn't matter if all 7.5 billion people on the planet get together and decide, yeah, the Book of Mormon's false, or if all 7.5 billion say, Joseph Smith is a false prophet because he did this and he said this and he acted in this way and he didn't give credit to so-and-so, on and on and on that list goes of finding fault or the church's faults because they aren't doing enough of this and they're doing too much of this and they've totally left this out. They're imperfect, so they're faults. If all 7.5 billion people all get together and agree that all those things are faults, what changes about the book or Joseph or our prophet or the church? Those things don't change. The only thing that changes is us because of our belief and what we then do to act on that belief or unbelief. The best true-false test, like I said, happens when you look in the mirror and say, Tyler, are you true or are you false? Are you true to the truth that's been given to you, to the light and knowledge, or are you going to spend your life pointing out the falseness or the errors that you perceive from your perspective are you going to spend that time tearing down other, other people's claims? True happiness comes from being true to the truth that God has given us. And so I love the statement from Jesus, know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's that idea of then be true to that moving forward, recognizing you're going to find some imperfections along the way. even within something that is established by God and created by God. Just like I can find imperfections in something that was created and established by God, and somehow he's okay with that. He's okay with, with progression and with development over time. So to summarize, when I go to church, I don't feel like the church is going to save me because I can't. I've only got one savior and he has a name. It's Jesus Christ. I go to the church 
for a, an opportunity to connect not only with God but with others who are striving to move forward on this covenant path, who are striving to learn and live the gospel of Jesus Christ more fully. So then the question comes, do I really need the church or can I just take the elements of the gospel and move forward on my own or with my family? Well, look at what he says. Coming down to – so we finish talking about the church segment and he, he then shifts in verse 13 to speaking about his gospel. Behold, I have given unto you my gospel. Notice it's not just another gospel of many. This is my gospel, so we would translate that to say the gospel of – of, there's that word again – Jesus Christ. And this is the gospel which I have given unto you. If you're marking your scriptures, you can take verse 13 where he says, this is the gospel which I have given unto you, and you could circle it. Then if you go down to verse 21, notice he says, verily I say unto you, this is my gospel. If you circle this is my gospel, this is the gospel, connect those, you now have bookends. You have a beginning and an ending point, and between those you have Jesus himself giving you a definition saying, this is it. On a silver platter, this is my gospel. It's this ancient literary technique that uh, modern biblical scholars have called inclusio, uh, just means inclusion basically, where they're making sure that it's very clear, this is where it begins, this is where it ends. This is my gospel, this is my gospel. So that you don't have to wonder what is or isn't it contained in his definition. And this is the Savior himself giving you the definition. This is worth taking some serious time on to analyze what is the gospel, because if we understand what it is, then we'll better understand also what it isn't. Look closely. Second half of verse 13. This is the gospel which I have given unto you, that, number one, I came into the world to do the will of the Father. So step one in the gospel is Jesus came to the world. He condescended to come down into the world to do God's will. He didn't come down to, to have a vacation. The creator of worlds without number didn't come down to a resort. He didn't come down to a lavish palace. In fact, he wasn't even born in, in even remotely pleasant circumstances. So he came into the world to do the will of my Father because my Father sent me. This is an important part of the gospel, that Jesus isn't doing things on his own or in isolation. He's fulfilling the purposes of God. Look at verse 14, and my Father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross. That's interesting because sometimes in the church we have a, an aversion to talking about crucifixion and the cross experience, and yet in the Book of Mormon uh, with Nephi back in, in Second Nephi and here with Jesus himself, they're not afraid to talk about the cross and the crucifixion event as part of the atonement. And Jesus says, I came, the God sent me, the Father sent me, that I might be lifted up upon the cross. Uh, notice, that I might draw all men unto me, that as I have been lifted up by men, even so should men be lifted up by my Father. So, He's got to be on the cross, lifted up by men to be slain so that he could then lift all up in the last day, the Father, through the power of the Son, to be judged. Okay? Look at this. Lifted up by the Father to stand before me to be judged of their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. You ready for the irony? 
so that you're not sitting there watching this thinking, oh no, I should get really nervous and I should be really afraid and fearful and trembling because someday I'm going to be uh, standing in front of the, the Savior to be judged of my works. The irony is this. Jesus was already judged of your works and he was found guilty and he was punished to the full extent of justice, to the full extent of law. He was already judged of your works. And because of his love and his compassion and his kindness, he now has the capacity to turn to you in a judgment context and extend mercy if you'll meet some terms of a new upgraded covenantal agreement that he's, that he's made with you that you couldn't pay this price to the Father that he did. He's already paid for it. It's all paid. It's done in full. He didn't leave anything hanging. It's all good. Now he turns to you and says, I did this for you. Now will you do a few things that I ask you to do in exchange? Look at verse 15. For this cause have I been lifted up, therefore according to the power of the Father, I will draw all men unto me that they may be judged according to their works. There it is again. If you notice, we're talking about Christ's own definition of his gospel. What is his gospel? He's telling you. And the first half, from verse 13 through 15, you'll notice a pattern here. There's nothing that you and I did to help him with this. This is all him. And then he shifts the focus in 16, and it shall come to pass that whoso repenteth. Now he's talking to us. Now he brings us into his definition of the gospel in verse 16 through 21. So notice this transition. 16 to 21, we would be sorely tempted to say, oh, I get it, I, I understand, so all of this is Jesus' role and then all of this is my role. He does this, I do this, we come together, we're all good. Hmm, that looks a little bit familiar, by the way. Christ's perfection and my imperfection coming together into one whole, and his is infinite in proportion. My, my imperfection is an infinite, therefore infinity swallows up my imperfection, and we're, we're good. It's perfect. That looks good. There's only one, one major flaw with this mindset. One major flaw with saying 16 through 21 is my part, 15, 13 through 15 is Jesus' part. Here's the flaw. I can't repent alone. I can't be baptized in my own name or on my own power or of my own accord. I can't endure to the end by myself. Brothers and sisters, Jesus did all of this without any help from you and me. I can't hope to do anything here without major help from him. I can't do one step in, in what is, quote-unquote, my part without, without his enabling grace, without his power and calling upon his abilities to, to get me through my parts of his gospel. And my parts of the gospel are the old, familiar Sunday school answers. Whoso repents and is baptized in my name shall be filled. Implication is Holy Ghost, gift of the Holy Ghost. And if he endureth to the end, behold, him will I hold guiltless before my Father at that day when I shall stand to judge the world. It's those people who he then turns to the Father, and as he says in Doctrine and Covenants, section 45, Father, behold the sin, the sufferings and the death of he who did no wrong, and then he advocates for us before the Father because we're willing to, to uh, do these things that he has asked us to do as our part of this gospel. 
that he is trying to spread across the world. Verse 17, he that endureth not unto the end, the same as he that is also hewn down and cast in the fire from whence they can no more return because of the justice of the Father. Now, I need to pause here because some of you may be struggling with your own faith. Some of you may have children who are struggling with the faith or with addictions or with uh, major, major issues of all types of varieties. This is not our role to be the judge and to determine when, when somebody is or is not enduring unto the end. We don't know all the factors. The only person who does know all of those issues and factors that each individual is facing, thankfully, he's the one who gets to do the judging, not us when it comes to this. So, look at verse 19. No unclean thing can enter into his kingdom, therefore nothing entereth into his rest, save it be those who have washed their garments in my blood because of their faith and the repentance of all their sins and their faithfulness unto the end. And then he finishes it with the commandment, repent all the ends of the earth and come unto me and be baptized in my name that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. If you're struggling or a loved one's struggling, brothers and sisters, the way to help is not to instill fear or, or coercion. We keep loving, we keep hoping, we keep praying because for some there, there may be factors, there may be situations that people are born with that we don't know, we don't, we don't have all of that, and we don't know what God is going to continue to do with them in the spirit worlds, even after this life. I guess what I'm saying is I love this definition of the gospel because it leaves all of the responsibility for judgment in the hands of the Lord but it gives us some things that we can actually do. And by the way, we're not going to do them perfectly. We're not going to repent perfectly. We're not going to have faith perfectly. We're not going to endure perfectly. But we combine our imperfection with his perfection. That's what the entire gospel of Jesus Christ is about. It's bringing everything that I have, everything that I am, everything that I ever hope to be, and placing it on the altar and saying, Lord, Thou knowest my strengths and my struggles better than I do, but I give them all to thee. I have a lot of questions, and I'm not going to let those questions about the church or about the Book of Mormon or the gospel get in the way of what I do know as I move forward in this process of trying to combine my life with my Savior, where I take all of my imperfections and I say, Lord, will you have me? Will, will you own me? Will you take me under your wings, so to speak, and claim me as your own? Because I want to be thy people, and I want thee to be my God as I move forward. That, brothers and sisters, is what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. It's not about a flawless performance. It's not about never messing up or never falling short or never offending or always getting it right. It's about learning to love the Lord and recognize his love for us and respond appropriately as we continue to try to strengthen that relationship and when we've messed up, figure out how to turn our heart and our mind more fully to him. I just hope you feel the love of the gospel, the love that we have for the scriptures, and just how amazing God's plan is. Let's talk for just a few more minutes about these two words that Tyler has focused us on in 3 Nephi 27, that this chapter really is focused on two core things, the church of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let's just talk briefly about what these words mean in our language. So, it turns out the word church really beautiful word, actually comes from an old phrase in Greek that is the Lord's home. So our English word church derives from an old Greek phrase 
the Lord's home. The gospel comes also from old words that means the good story or the good message. And what is that message? What is that story? It is the story of salvation. What's the message that Jesus provides? That he has done all things for us to save us if we'll choose to repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Ghost, and endure to the end. And by the way, isn't that phenomenally simple? I look at the world we live in, and there are systems everywhere, and many of them very complex. I've worked in business before where we had like charts and graphs and actually entire documentation for how to do things in the business, sometimes into thousands of pages of instructions for how to do things well. And what does God say? My message is this, trust me, show your trust in me by having faith, repenting of your sins, and get them all washed clean through the baptism, receive the Holy Ghost, and just endure to the end, and I will take you into my kingdom, and you'll be spotless. I mean, I have never known of any system, any organization, anything anywhere that is that simple. And the God of the universe wants to save every child that he can. And actually, he can save everybody if we are willing. It all ultimately is our choice. So that's the gospel. Let's think here again to the word church, the Lord's home. He's inviting us into his home. The home itself isn't salvation but you might go to his home to hear his stories, to hear about his life. So again, the church itself isn't salvation, that is Jesus, but it is where we can go to learn about salvation. It's a place of safety. There is structure here. You might find rules and policies, but they might change from time to time. Any of us who've ever lived in a home find that from time to time, we update how we do things in the home to better facilitate particular goals to accomplish some good story. And we should expect God's home to have updates from time to time. Maybe the furniture changes, or the walls, the painting on the walls, or whatever it might be. We shouldn't lose our cool if the church changes from time to time. It's the Lord's home. But the message hasn't changed. Throughout the history of God's work with people, it is all about how he loves us, and if we trust him, he will envelop us into his arms. So, as we, as we conclude chapter 27, you could, you could almost look at this like an analogy. It's almost as if the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a vehicle and the gospel of Jesus Christ is the engine that drives that vehicle. That, that, that analogy breaks down. Uh, very quickly, but there's just one way. Uh, it could also be seen as this is like the university, but this is what gets taught at the university, and they're not in competition. This is the means whereby God takes and spreads the gospel with its teachings and its ordinances into the whole world to be able to bless all of God's children, because we are all uh, striving. We all desperately need to to learn this good news, this good story, this good message. Um, how great the importance to make these things known unto all the inhabitants of the earth. Uh, so that's what the church is there for: is to be the means, the vehicle whereby we can share this glorious message and and establish these. Uh, opportunities for people to receive the saving ordinances that the Lord has prepared for us to connect us with him. Towards the end of chapter 27, in verse 27, notice what he tells to, the, to his twelve apostles. Know ye that ye shall be judges of this people according to the judgment which I shall give unto you. You'll notice he doesn't say, you're going to be judges, good luck with that. He says, you're going to be judges according to the judgment which I give unto you. Our bishops, our stake presidents, they are, and, and our prophets, seers and revelators, they are common judges in Israel, but they don't just judge according to their own whims. They seek God's direction according to the judgment which I shall give unto you, which shall be just. Therefore, what manner of men ought ye to be? 
Verily I send you, even as I am. Brothers and sisters, that right there is the overall message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's the overall goal of the Church of Jesus Christ is to help people to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not to learn gospel facts. It's not to win some trivial pursuit about the scripture game. It's not so that you can get the praise and the glory of the world. It's a very real mission to help people learn about their Savior, have desires to come unto him and to be perfected in him so that we can be even as he is and in a more gender-inclusive um, way, we wouldn't say what manner of men ought you to be, because here he's talking to twelve men, twelve apostles. We would say what manner of people or what manner of, of sons and daughters of God would the Lord have us be, even as he is, this, this perfect pattern for us. Now, you jump into chapter 28, which is where Jesus is, is going to finally say farewell to the apostles, uh, and before he leaves, he basically gives them the opportunity to say, what, what do you want? And uh, nine of them in verse 2 said, well, when we've reached the age of a man, we want to speedily come into thy kingdom unto thee. And you'll notice he says in verse 3, well, when you're 72 years old, then ye shall come unto me in my kingdom, and with me ye shall find rest. This is interesting. You'll come unto me in my kingdom and find rest, you nine. And then he turns to the three. What do you want? Once again, he already knows what they want, but he's asking them, letting them ask. And they're a bit nervous, a bit unsure of themselves, and none of them really wants to be voice for the group of three, so he says, well, I, I know what you want. I know your thoughts, verse 6, you want the same thing that John, my beloved apostle, wanted. You want to stay here. You want to keep, keep working on the earth. Notice verse 8, ye shall never endure the pains of death, but when I shall come in my glory, ye shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality, and then shall ye be blessed in the kingdom of my Father. Then in 29, uh, the, the rest of 28 is stories about those three Nephites and how people tried to destroy them and kill them and that nothing works. You can't destroy them. To me, brothers and sisters, that part of the chapter is a lot more than just about three men who can't be killed. It's about things that God has ordained and empowered and infused with his mission, his ability, that you can't destroy them. People try to tear down the Book of Mormon. They try to tear down different historical characters in the church because of perceived imperfections based on a 21st century cultural sensitivity, or they try to tear down all kinds of things that God has set up. And the fact is, as you read through 28, looking at these examples of the three Nephites, just I hope the words will echo in your mind, no unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing, just like no unhallowed hand could destroy these, these three disciples. What God has ordained to move forward is going to move forward, and we can't stop it. So we come back to chapter 29 and notice he talks about when you see these sayings, when you see this book coming forth, he's reiterating here the fact that uh, Jesus pointed out back in, in 3rd Nephi chapter 20 and 21, when you see the book coming forth, you can know the end is going to be coming. We're in the latter days. God is doing his work. He's fulfilling his covenant which he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's return to the Old Testament to get a beautiful and very empowering perspective on God's work, his covenants. So, 3 Nephi 29 is crucial to understand the modern day. God is declaring that the Book of Mormon 
is a witness, it's a sign that his covenant is being fulfilled, that he remembers what he has covenanted, as Tyler said, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Go with me to Exodus chapter 2, verse 24. The Israelites have now been in Egyptian bondage, terrible, groaning bondage. And here's what happens. Genesis, sorry, Exodus chapter 2, verse 24. And God heard their groaning of the Israelites, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. This is where we begin to see incredible and mighty acts of God's miraculous saving power. So if you return back to the Old Testament and look at the five books of Moses, which are called the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, those five books contain the great deeds that God has done because of his covenant to save his people. And those stories are preserved as evidence to us of what God's character is. So as we hear in 3 Nephi 29 that God will remember his covenant, and we wonder, well, what does that even mean? Well, the Book of Mormon reveals it and explains it, but if you want additional evidence for God's character and what it means for him to be a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God, you can just go back to the Torah, the five books of Moses, and the word Torah means instruction, covenantal instruction, and be reminded of all the mighty deeds of wonder and miracle that God did to save his people in the difficulties that they found themselves in. And as they turned to him, they found peace and prosperity. That is the covenant, and God will remember it, and nobody can stop it. Just like the mighty Pharaoh and the mighty Egyptian civilization could not stand against God in all his power, in our day, there is nothing on this earth that can stand against God remembering and fulfilling his covenants, and those covenants are for you. You know what this, uh, you know what all of this discussion brings to my mind, to the, to the forefront of my mind, is God's attribute of love. I don't know of any other situation where a person can be so good, so perfect, so complete in, in keeping their side of a bargain, looking from God's perspective, and then there's me. I'll just speak for myself. I am so flawed. I have so many struggles. I'm so unfaithful to him in, in certain settings when I, I do things I know I shouldn't do, but I still do them. But God loves me anyway, and he keeps coming back to a covenant connection with me. He keeps extending mercy and forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, I hope you're not seeing in your mind's eye a God who is in heaven, who is uh, angry at you with folded arms across his chest and a furrowed brow because you messed up again. I hope you're hearing the voice of a good shepherd who's calling after you saying, I love you, I want to help you, I know you have struggles, there are people who have addictions, there are people who have mental, physical, emotional issues going on, and I hope as we've gone through these particular chapters that you haven't felt beat up, but rather built up, that you feel hope in this covenant that was made so long ago by a God who is more powerful than all the worlds combined, that he, a God who holds worlds without number in his hand, actually holds you in his heart. He loves you, and he is your good shepherd, he is your savior, and he's going to keep working with you. And so my hope, our hope, is that we won't give up on this covenant path journey that sometimes seems long, sometimes it seems impossibly hard, that we'll turn to him and move forward. Now, chapter 30, the shortest chapter in the entire Book of Mormon, two verses long. It's Mormon's inspired invitation to the Gentiles of the latter day. Notice he starts with, hearken, O ye Gentiles, which is more than just hear, it's to hear and to heed obey, to follow. Hearken, 
and to hear the words of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, which he hath commanded me that I should speak concerning you. For behold, he commandeth me that I should write, saying, so in other words, this is Mormon saying, I'm writing by what you might call divine investiture of authority. I'm, sp I'm writing as if I were the Savior himself. Here are his words, verse 2, turn. The Hebrew context of the word repent is to turn, so you could replace that word there with repent, all ye Gentiles, turn, ye Gentiles, from your wicked ways and repent of your evil doings. It's, it's saying the same thing two different ways, which is a beautiful Hebrew uh, literary technique. Repent of your evil doings, of your lyings and deceivings, and of your whoredoms, and of your secret abominations, and your idolatries, and of your murders, and, per, and your priestcrafts, and your envyings, and your strifes, and from all your wickedness and abominations, and come unto me and be baptized in my name. You notice the beautiful pattern here based on what we've talked about with the church and the gospel? We bring all of our imperfection and let that be swallowed up in his perfection. How do we do that? By entering that covenant with him, beginning with our baptism, that ye may receive a remission of your sins and be filled with the Holy Ghost, that ye may be numbered with my people who are of the house of Israel. There is room in this house for all of the beloved children of our heavenly parents. They want all of their children who are willing to come into the Lord's house and to partake of his goodness and uh, feast at his table uh, to, to do so. Now we finish with 4th Nephi. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, we've spent the entire uh, Book of Mormon up to this point trying to get the people to a point where they can become even as Jesus is, and now, finally, we get there in 4th Nephi. We get the perfect society, so we've had the ups and the downs, the high points and the low points, but now we built this perfect society, and it's going to last for 200 years of, of perfection. You'll notice that in verse 1 of 4th Nephi, he tells you in the 30 and 4th year that it passed away in the 30 and 5th, disciples of Jesus had formed a church of Christ in all the lands round about, and as many as did come unto them and did truly repent of their sins were baptized in the name of Jesus, and they did also receive the Holy Ghost. There's that second half of the gospel of Jesus Christ definition, right? Notice what happens in verse uh, 2. 30 and 6th year, the people were all converted unto the Lord upon all the face of the land, both Nephites and Lamanites, and there was, notice the very first thing he mentions after them keeping these first principles and ordinances of the gospel, there was no, there were no contentions and disputations among them, and every man did deal justly one with another. There's a pattern in 4th Nephi, because you're going to find that more than any other attribute of this society, Mormon mentions no contention more than anything. Four times you're going to get the no contention issue in this perfect society. Living in our, uh, in our world today, filled with uh, various fights and contentions over politics or sports or religion or beliefs, or practices or different organizations contending one with another and fighting. It's interesting to, to watch the pattern here with these Nephites and Lamanites who God has worked with and now they become one. They become Zion for 200 years and the number one thing that's mentioned more than any other is they stopped fighting. They, they no longer contended with each other. Notice verse 3 gives you more uh, characteristics. They had all things common. There were no rich, no poor. There was no bond, no free. They were all made free and partakers of the heavenly gift. 
and it talks about the great and marvelous works that were performed in verse 5. And then notice what happens. Here we are in the latter days surrounded with struggles, and we finally get to Zion, and we think, okay, Mormon, now we've, we've slogged our way through all of these wars and contentions and secret combinations and wickedness and whoredoms and iniquities and all this bad stuff, we finally have a perfect society, oh, now we can relax, just pour it on us. Now watch what he does. Verse 6, Thus did the thirty and eighth year pass away, and also the thirty and ninth, and forty and first, and forty and second, and yea, even until forty and nine years had passed away, and also the fifty and first, and the fifty and second, yea, even until the fifty and nine years had passed away. Excuse me? Brothers and sisters, we just covered twenty-one years, and he didn't tell you anything new. He said, yeah, everything that you saw in verse three, four, and five, yeah, it continued twenty-one years. 21 years, we just covered the same rough period of time as the war chapters that covered 22 years from Alma 43 through 63. Wait a minute. He spent all of that space in our Book of Mormon covering just one year more than what you got in verse 6, and oh, and by the way, you think verse 6 is good? Turn the page over. Look at uh, Look at verse 14, and it came to pass that the seventy and first year passed away, and also the seventy and second year, and in fine till the seventy and ninth year had passed away, yea, even until an hundred years had passed away. You just covered twenty-nine years, and he didn't tell you anything. Isn't it fascinating that we finally get to the perfect part of our society, and Mormon gives you one, two, three, four pages. That's it. And the page, uh, the, the pages aren't devoted to what it's like to be a disciple in a perfect society. He spends most of the time talking about the rise of Zion, what, it, what they did to get here, and then the second half of 4th Nephi is the steps that they followed to lose Zion, but he doesn't give you much here. So as you study through all of, of this beautiful book, 4th Nephi, this, this one-chapter book, mark the steps that it took them to get to Zion and then pay attention to and maybe mark the things that caused them to lose Zion. And here's the cool thing. We don't have, we don't have to wait for the millennium. We don't have to wait for the collective group to build Zion. We can take the steps required as an individual, as a couple, as a family, as a ward, as a stake, as a church, as a community. We can do we, – we can take these same steps to seek for that oneness. It's not sameness, you're not going to be the same, but you can be unified with people around you and to avoid these steps that cause more contention and disunity. Satan is all about separating us. Christ is all about bringing us together to be one, at one meant. It's, it's everything he's trying to do is to bring us together. We love you. We love your love for the Lord, your love for the gospel. It's inspiring to us. And we hope you feel deep encouragement as you read the scriptures and hear these messages that this is for all of us, that we can find ourselves at one with God and experience Zion. Know that you're loved. Uh -huh.